Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Founders Grid sponsored by Gaper.io. Today we have Ryan. Ryan is the founder of Radon. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. So give us a brief background about yourself, what you've been doing prior to founding Radon. Yeah, so I guess um, to go all the way back, I started my first business in fourth grade. Um, it was a paper airplane business. I was making um, paper airplanes out of paper. And the thing I liked about it was there was no, there was relatively no cost and it was high in creativity. So I could just take a piece of paper, fold it into anything I could think of, and then sell it uh, to all my classmates for their lunch money. Um, and that was really great. And I've been searching and working to get back to the high of fourth grade. Um, because I, I think, I think that it, that business had really the core principles of a good business, which is you're providing joy and helping other people with your brain through creativity. Um, so at Radon, that's, that's what I'm always trying to do and trying to make sure that we're mainly providing value with, with our brains um, and, and doing so in a creative way and um, not so much working on arbitrage opportunities and things like that, but mainly trying to create value out of the new, which is often quite difficult, but I find more fun and exciting. God, God. So just trying to keep the conversation slightly relevant towards recent times because of yeah, yeah. COVID, you know, how has... The... I won't talk about fourth grade anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, as a founder, okay, let's start with how COVID has impacted uh, Radon's business. You know, let's start with that and let, yeah. we'll discuss how as a founder your mindset. Yeah. So as, as I was thinking about, as I was thinking about this podcast, I was thinking about this, this term, you know, remote employment, remote work, uh, which is something that has always for me been very confusing. Um, because I'm not, I'm not so sure. So obviously I know what it is, right? The, the concept is that you're not going into the office anymore. You're, you're outside of the office. Um, and you're at home working remotely with, with, you know, your vendors or, or your colleagues or your customers. Um, but what's interesting about that is, and I think this is true. I mean, you, you tell me what you think, but I think for really the past 20 years, the world, I mean, as long as I've been alive, the world has been progressively getting more and more remote. I mean, if you think about it, like five years ago, you have had essentially everyone working remote, but they're just in an office, right? Like when you go into the office, it's not like they were actually doing anything in that office that was not remote. I mean, at, at least at the places that I've worked and, and the companies that I've seen, they would go into the office, sign onto a computer and do work on, on a computer and interact with people on a phone um, and, and store all their information um, on the cloud. Um, any any work materials would be sent back and forth either with you know Google Drive or emails. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't like people were there wasn't really a need for people to be congregated in one physical location except for the social aspect. Um, so in my mind, it's almost like the pandemic was not a trigger. Uh, but more, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a, um, uh, you know, I think the way that most people see it is like the world went remote because, because of the pandemic. And I think the world was already remote and then the pandemic just showed everyone. Yes, we can go remote. Okay. We're already remote. Hmm. Yeah. That's an interesting thought. That caught me off. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings me to my next question. Um, how, how are you able to manage your team or what productivity hacks you're using in your company, especially? Yes, I agree with you on that part. It's a very good thought. 
but you know the work life balance maybe office and home uh, they gave you a separation with the work life yeah because in the corporate world majority of them are workaholics so you know when they came back home it was like okay it's time out it's a personal time right but now yeah. your home has become office so the work life balance is many are unable to keep that maintain that so yeah things you adapted yourself personally and what things are you encouraging amongst your team to maintain a work life balance primarily for mental health yeah so i i think that that humans are are community creatures so we we base our actions based off of the people around us um so i think that going into an office and seeing someone sit next to you and work helps you know like i know when to eat this is real i know when to eat based off of when everyone starts making noise in the office and i'm like oh okay it must be time to eat um if i'm at home and i'm i'm writing code i have no idea i i mean it was just I'll go it all sudden it'll be you know six o'clock at night. I have no idea what's going on. The only way I know is I start getting a call. I start getting calls from my friends or my girlfriend or something like that. That's the only way I know in fact, I have all my notifications turned off, so I actually have no idea what's going on um but I would say that I think the I think that the biggest thing that I've tried to implement is creating uh virtual communities and entering myself into virtual communities which help me get that get back that cadence um so I, for instance you know I, I spend a decent amount of time on twitter um and i can see a lot of people tweeting you know during the day and then it starts to tail off and then i'm like okay i guess it's the end of the day and things things like that um i think we're in the infancy of uh digital communities um but i would i would i have a feeling that work life balance will get significantly better once people feel more fulfilled in their work and can actually sign off because i think a lot of people are just chasing like they don't feel like they've done enough probably because they haven't <laughs> during the day so they're like i feel like i have to continue to work um but if they felt like they were actually getting something done they would probably have no problem signing off um at you know four and going and spending time with their children true 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 so which brings me to the next question in regards to how's the experience been at trade on so can you elaborate more on the business model how it has evaluated evolved over the last the product market fit the service market fit so yeah so um we've we've made a I guess you could say it's a life cycle. Uh it, it's essentially I think it's like 15 or 20 steps uh that we take people through uh to take to take their their ideas. Most people come and they have they have an idea of a way to automate their business or they have uh a set of APIs they want developed which in in is essentially just a modern version of automating your business. um they have some concept of how of how they want a machine to do work um and we've developed a process to be able to step them through uh and figure out what should actually get built um and and it's it's really been rewarding because uh we we can see that it's that the more we take people through it the better we get at it we tweak things um and and it's it's allowed us to save a lot of interestingly it's allowed us to save a huge amount of uh, engineering time uh because i think most engineering firms uh software firms because they're doing work that is you know cutting edge uh and already is leveraged in some way they don't have to be critical on their own on their own process and they don't have to actually think about how are we taking how are we what are we building for people how how are we thinking about how we're building it um so because they they already have a leveraged work that can make them money so they don't have to optimize it too much uh but we've tried to take the approach that we're doing nothing special um mm -hmm. and so 
the special has to come from us. It has, we have to, we have to figure out a special version of the process because, uh, you know, software engineering is ubiquitous as plumbing. Yeah. Um, Got that. Got that. So, and where do you see it on three years from now? Uh, so I, I'm really excited about, um, about teaching. Okay. Um, and I, I really, my, my dream, uh, is in three years to have a, a solid base of, of Radon University, um, where people will be able to learn how to start an automation, um, company and learn how to learn how to, um, take hard skills such as software engineering, design, sales, things like this, and actually package them together in a way that they can take existing businesses and, and automate them, which, which effectively is the way that we've had most, like it's how we've had progress throughout societies, right? Like, you know, before we automated agriculture, we were picking berries. Um, so I think that the, I think that I, I really believe in it. I think it's really important. I think it's one of the biggest things besides my spirituality that separates us from monkeys, um, is our ability to innovate. So I, I, my hope is to be able to teach more people this process of innovating. God. Ryan, thank you so much for being on the show. I'm pretty sure we could have talked for another half an hour, but my mind, <laughs> they've just, you know, they cut off the podcast after 12 minutes. So it doesn't look nice to have that podcast. So, <laughs> Ryan, thank you so much for being on the show. Take care of yourself. Thank you. Thank you.